Thank, thanks so much for coming, Dr. Cantley, and thanks so much for those personal compliments. Our first speaker is uh, designated as our first speaker, not by accident. Dr. Jerry Spivak has been a leader in the field of myeloproliferative neoplasms for his, his entire life. Uh, that's about, uh, his professional life is only about 10 years, <laughs> young man. But I'm very, everyone was supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> that's better, yeah, you know, give it up for Jerry. But uh, Jerry has really been a partner in these sessions. Uh, he has had a lot of scientific input on topics and selection of speakers, particularly for those of you who are coming to the professional session on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I might say it's very unusual for two professionals to still have a warm friendship. Uh, that goes back almost 20 years for planning these sessions, uh, both the patient sessions and the professional sessions. And we're still very good friends. We kid each other a lot. We don't always agree, but we always respect each other. Jerry Spivak. And by the way, uh, all, all our speakers are very, very distinguished. They have all kinds of titles, and we don't uh, elaborate on them, except we'll mention one in particular later on. But uh, we just introduced people as doctors. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's been my welcome. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is the fact that I was uh, a medical student here for four years. Richard was on the faculty, uh, and we're still friends. Uh, now, I want to, in the spirit of full disclosure, um, I'm delighted to talk on the topic that I've been given, uh, but I'm going to present a lot of data uh, this morning, which is bad form, but the good news is that I've left a glossary out there of terms so that you can all be informed, and even the better news, I'm going to be followed by uh, many uh, outstanding scientists uh, who will reiterate these themes as we go along. So uh, if I can have the first slide, I, am I the one? Oh, okay. All right. So let's begin, uh, and I want to start backwards. I've found that many of my patients uh, have never seen their blood, and they're always interested to find out about it. So doctors talk, oh, hematologists are hematologists because we are essentially uh, pathologists who see patients. So we like to look at blood smears. So I've put up uh, sections from a blood smear to show you the, um, uh, the red cells, which are um, stained uh, for the hemoglobin they contain. And you'll see the arrows down, you see little teeny cells, I've enlarged them, uh, and these are the blood platelets. These are things that give people headaches. Uh, they can make your hands and feet burn. Uh, they can make you see flashing lights. Not in everybody, but when they're sticky, and an aspirin usually takes that away. Uh, and then I've shown you some white cells, the neutrophils, uh, and you can see on these cells the dark staining materials, the DNA and the nucleus. Uh, the cytoplasma in these cells doesn't stain. There's granules in there that contain many types of potent enzymes. They don't stain, and we call them neutrophils. They're the most common blood cell. They fight bacteria. Um, and then we have these cells that stain, the granules stain purple. They're the basophils. This is what makes people with polycythemia vera itch. Now, uh, many people in this room have had a bone marrow. Uh, and I thought I'd show you what... Uh, this is the bone marrow biopsy, the more painful part of the procedure, where we get to look at the architecture. And there's a little section of bone down here, and this great mass of some of these large so-called empty spaces are actually fat cells, provide nutrients. You look down here, you see some big cells. Those are the megakaryocytes that make the platelets. Whoopsie. I'm going to go backwards. Oh, here. Um, and you can see there are uh, other cells in here that pathologists would know are white cell precursors, and then there are the red cells. Now, patients do get myelofibrosis, and we can't tell that unless we do a stain on the marrow. And this is the silver stain, um, not named after Richard. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot older than that. Um, and it stains fibers, and all marrow has fibers. This is fairly dense fibers. We're not staining the cells. You can see the cells are in the interstitiuses. They're there. 
they're functioning well. The fibrosis is a reactive problem. All right, so let's go. We're going to talk about these three diseases. Uh, polycythemia vera is the commonest and most unique because all three cell lines are elevated, whether it appears that way or not. Uh, but let me move on. Uh, let's talk first about hereditary disease. And it turns out that as we sit here, unfortunately, we are all creating mutations. Some land in places that are harmful, and some land in places where they're trivial. And so um, assuming you get a, a mutation that alters the DNA in an untoward way, um, what will happen then? Well, that's up to the patient, not the mutation so much. And we don't know about our own individual DNA. We know about population DNA, as I'm going to show you in a second. So I have a thing called penetrance. You can have the gene, you may not have the disease. Or you can have the gene and you may have one of the three diseases and not the others. That's patient host genetic variation. That's up to the individual patient, whether you like it or not. And then we get the clinical manifestations. Now there are other things that we're going to talk about, age, sex, what we call germline defects, defects that are carried in, through from, uh, from your parents. Uh, that are in the so-called germline, the reproductive cells. We're going to talk about disease duration, the types of mutations, clonal dominance, and other things that are going on. So here, let's start back with genetics, the basic unit of cell biology, the cell, it's plasma membrane. It has a nucleus where the DNA is, and the DNA is replicated there into, um, into itself or uh, transcribed into RNA, RNA to the cytoplasm where you make Protein. Now you have 22,000 genes, they're not all turned on at the same time. You have 3 billion nucleotides, the bases that make up the DNA. So you can imagine replicating those on a continuous cycle all the time. You're gonna, cells are going to make mistakes. If the mistake sticks in the wrong place, you have a mutation. Now, when you translate, uh, transcribe DNA to RNA, that's where we have gene expression. That's what we talk about. What genes are now being turned on? And sometimes turned off, and then you make protein, and there is a protein code. Huh? The cell doesn't do anything unless it's told to from the outside. And what you have here on, um, see if I can find the pointer here, is a receptor. Now cells have many receptors. This is a cartoon. Receptors have made up proteins. This receptor happens to have two proteins. We call it a dimer, and it doesn't do anything until it gets its ligand here. This red object, which would be a growth factor in terms of blood cells. And once the receptor turns on, it sends a signal to the nucleus, start making genes. Okay, so let's go on. And what happens? I'm going to show you the power of a mutation. So this is the thrombopoietin receptor, which is the center of the universe as far as the myeloproliferative disorders are concerned. Now the mouse is a good model to look at human disease pretty much replicates humans, but the mouse has thrombocytosis. And I've shown you 40 amino acids, and this is amino acid code, each amino acid has a different alphabetical uh, symbol, and the thrombopoietin receptor has over 600 amino acids. I'm only showing you 40. And an amino acid 39 in the mouse is an amino acid called asparagine. Now, if you did the same sequencing of the human thrombopoietin receptor. The human has a platelet count of 250,000 on average. And in that 39th position is the amino acid lysine. Well, Dr. Moliterno and I did some sequencing way back 2003 and 4 in some human beings who had high platelet counts. And we found in these human beings, guess what? They had the mouse amino acid and they had a high platelet count. Uh, at the time, I have to have an aside, the, the NPN field is like no other. Everyone said, well, you got the wrong gene. Um, we won't go there. But if you convert that gene in the mouse, take out the uh, asparagine in the mouse, guess, guess what happens to the mouse platelet count? It comes down to normal. We had the right gene. So now, here's the crux of this lecture in a way. These are the genetics of the acquisition of an NPN. And on the horizontal axis, I have gene frequency, and I, these are sort of relative numbers. They're very low numbers, going from 10 to the minus 7 down. Uh, and on the um, y-axis, I have frequency, and again, low numbers. 
Now, there is in the population, uh, we have what we call haplotypes, sequences of DNA. It's in your old handout. Um, that influence what genes do. We don't always know why, but in the JAK2 gene is a certain sequence of uh, DNA that it goes by the uh, GGCC. These are uh, two of the nucleotides. Um, and this is in a high frequency in the population, but has very low penetrance. It accounts for about 50% of the risk of getting a JAK2 mutation. So a small percentage of the population has this high frequency, low penetrance gene. Now, if you move down the curve where the frequency gets even less in the population, you have the single germline nucleotide polymorphisms. We don't call them mutations in the germline. We call them SNPs or uh, single nucleotide variations. And this is a family uh, that we study that has a high platelet count coming down through the family. Um, and that's due to germline mutations. And then you get even rarer. Patients in families with myeloproliferative disorders in which more members of the family will have a mutation and a myeloproliferative disorder than you can explain on the basis of chance. This is very uncommon, and I don't counsel families to be looking to see whether anyone has a gene mutation. If you did, it would show up soon enough. So. Okay, now, um, in this slide, I'm showing you the... Um, age on the horizontal axis, on the x-axis, and on the uh, y-axis we have rate in a log scale. So things are going to jump by orders of magnitude. And I have some bars there, age 60 for those in the back of the room who can see it, and then that goes over to the y-axis on the log scale. And what you see um, in the myeloproliferative disorders side of the slide are um, an, an increase from a young age all the way up, and when you get up over age 60, you can see the logarithmic increase is rather large. Now, I've paired that, the same thing with acute leukemia, different population, and you see the same thing. It's actually, you have fewer uh, patients with the disease down here. You get over 60, and it gets very high. So I always wondered, what's going on here? How do you get the disease here? And then you're still, people are still getting it out here. And I thought, is there a long latent period here? No. This is something peculiar to um, human beings. This is just uh, for acute leukemia. This, again, is the same type of thing I've shown you patients who have a mutation. And this is over time. And you can see up to age 60, not much is going on, less than 0.5% of patients. And over age 60, up you go. And then this is the rate of acute leukemia. It is not as high as having the mutation. This is why I, I don't always recommend people, let's, we got the latest, it's a new bright shiny toy, next generation sequencing, let's go see what mutations we have. You can have the mutation without the disease. That's penetrance. So uh, now, well, why do patients with leukemia get their disease mostly after age 60? And, Myeloproliferative disorders, you can get them at age 20. You can get them at age 18. Well, it turns out the JAK2 mutation doesn't respect age. You don't have to have enough mutations to finally get, have, lose the lottery. You can have the mutation coming out of the uterus. Uh, it's rare. And so these arrows show you um, where, we can, where people can do studies um, using next generation sequencing and see the JAK2 mutation before age 60. And then after age 60, it goes up. So now we understand why we have at any age a myeloproliferative, get a myeloproliferative neoplasm. But even more important than that is on this slide, again, the same thing. We're going to have frequency on this axis. And then we're going to have here something different that isn't used enough, what we call the allele burden. How many genes have the mutation? Now, this is something that Every patient needs to know, and they don't, they, the pathologist will tell you, oh, well, you just need a qualitative mutation. Later on, get a quantitative. You need a quantitative mutation to start to see how much disease you actually have. And what was seen here in a study from Denmark, in the, um, oh, here we go, um, at low levels of having the mutation, most patients didn't have disease. And they went back sometime uh, 
I think, eight years later, and there were still patients who didn't have the disease. This is penetrance. So a qualitative test of the mutation tells you nothing. You need to know how much mutation you have because the patients who have more mutation are the ones who get the disease. Now, let's go back to age and sex and time. Uh, we have, this is a nice chart prepared by Dr. Moliterno. We have women at the top, men at the bottom. And red is polycythemia vera. Um, the no color is ET. And the dark color is primary myelofibrosis. And what you see here is that at younger ages, it's women who get the myeloproliferative disorders much more than men. You get over age 60, men start to get it. You get over age 60, primary myelofibrosis starts. Totally different disease in its own way. And you get leukemia over age 60, mostly in men, if it's not caused by drugs people give. Now, these are the three muta these are the three important proteins in which there are mutations. The top is the JAK2 gene, and it's a cartoon of the gene, or uh, the protein, either way you can look at it. And you can see the mutations up here, the ones that this is the common one, the JAK2 mutation is here, which releases this kinase domain from inhibition. And there are other mutations down here, usually causing, uh, these are germline, mostly causing just um, thrombocytosis. This gene is in every cell, so you can get every type of myeloproliferative neoplasm from this gene. This is the thrombopoietin receptor, and I'll show you it's not in every cell, but it's in the stem cell. So obviously, got to look at that. And these are uh, mutations that most of the ones up here we found, not this one. And then the other ones down here. These are less serious. These are more serious down in the transmembrane and the cytoplasmic domain. And generally, you only get essential thrombocytosis or primary myelofibrosis. Now, this is a, the star of the moment, cow reticulin. And this was found by next generation sequencing. It was totally unexpected. This is what we call chaperone. This is a protein that tells other proteins where to go and helps them get there. If here we don't have, these are all point mutations taking out one amino acid, but here we have something entirely different. We have deletions and we have insertions, which again change the message. And what happens when cal reticulin has a mutation, it allows two things happen. One, it's no longer anchored where it should be in the cell. It can go anywhere it wants. Number two, now this part of the uh, protein can bind the thrombopoietin receptor and it can take it to the surface of the cell, and it can activate it. So you've got two things going on. You've got JAK2, which can activate MPL, and you've got cal reticulin, which can activate MPL, uh, JAK2 through MPL, and you've got MPL mutation, so it gets a little complex. So let's move on here, and this is to show you what happens. So here you have um, the erythropoietin receptor, and you can see it's this typical dimeric form, and here's JAK2. It needs JAK2 as it's transmitting kinase. And when the erythropoietin receptor sees its ligand erythropoietin, that allows the two JAK2s to see each other. They phosphorylate each other and everything else in the cell, and away you go, making red cells. But if you have a JAK2 mutation, you don't need erythropoietin anymore. The cell can go on its own. So that's what's happening there. Now here's the thrombopoietin receptor. It's the same thing. It's a dimeric receptor, and it re has a JAK2, and it requires a kinase. It requires a signal, which is thrombopoietin. But if you have a JAK2 mutation, you don't need thrombopoietin anymore. Or if you have one of these other mutations, I, we just have here the uh, thrombopoietin muta uh, mutations, um, you can activate JAK2 that way. And if you look at the last cartoon, what you can see is cow reticulum binds where you would expect the ligand to bind. And it activates the thrombopoietin receptor. Now, let's leave that for the moment and go back to our cells. Now, I'm going to put this all together. And when you look at cells in the bone marrow and the blood, what you see are the cells I showed you. You don't see the mega carriers. In the bone marrow, you see the mega carriers that makes the platelets. You can see all these other cells, the basophils, the neutrophils, and what have you. Lymphocytes don't count because they don't need JAK2 for anything. 
All right, but then in the bone marrow are the stem cells. So this is a classic hierarchy. You go from the, uh, the stem cell down this way, myeloid, this to lymphoid. That's no longer true. So you gotta look at this, get, things get a little more complex. The point I wanna make is up here is a stem cell that self renews, but it's usually sleeping. And this guy does all the work. But we used to think it went, whoopsie, we used to think it went this way, but now we know that a stem cell can go right to a megakaryocytic stem cell. So you can get ET with JAK2 only in the platelets, so-called triple negative. If anyone cared to look, we published this a lot of years ago that, yeah, if you just look in the platelets, which no one looks, you'll see JAK2. But you can get a megakaryocyte erythroid cell. That's important because that gives you polycythemia vera. Or you can get a common myeloid megakaryocytic erythroid cell, and that can give you polycythemia vera, or it can give you primary myelofibrosis. So this is occurring back here, up at this side. Down here, uh, you can see uh, the three receptors, but only one of them is up here, even though you can make three different kinds of cells. So the interferon works up here, and ruxolitimid or chikafi works down here. All right, so this starts to explain some things. This is a patient of Dr. Molitorno's. This is the axis in time, months. This is a hemoglobin level, and these are the normal range. And she's going along well, and she's had myelofibrosis for 17 years, on hydroxyurea, and all of a sudden, her hemoglobin red cell count goes up. Whoopsie, sorry. And she has polyphylacemia vera. How'd that happen? A different stem cell got involved. It's not magic. Okay. Here's a patient of mine over a period of six years. A man, he started out with a normal hemoglobin, he had a platelet count of a million. I don't have any men that often. And sure, in six years, all of a sudden, sure enough, up goes his red cell, his red cell count, and he now has polycythemia vera. Uh, he still has it. It's 2017, doing well. Okay. Now, the other thing that's going on here that you have to think about is these are all the mutations. And which disease has most of the mutations, polycythemia vera. So if you're looking at the three diseases, what you really care about is this disease. This is the one you should always be looking for. Now, this starts to explain why someone who has a high platelet count, particularly women, is going to show up one day with polycythemia vera. And if it's a man, they may show up one day with primary myelofibrosis. And it can go either way. You can have primary, as I've shown you, Things go back and forth, but polycythemia vera is the king. Now, unfortunately, if you look in your glossary, you're going to find a definition of alternate facts, or as uh, other people call <laughs> fake news. This is not trivial. Uh, this really makes me very sad. So here is the premier blood uh, journal, Blood, and in it, some experts are opining that Essential thrombocytosis and polycythemia vera are just a continuum of the same disease. How can that be? This is fake news. Sorry to tell you. So here's gene expression. We've published this. Other people have published this. It's not, gee, you're not looking at my data. You're not looking at my data, but that's a different story. And, and what you see here are genes that are expressed in polycythemia and essential thrombocytosis. Now, two things, three things you see here. One, women dysregulate different genes than men do. Sex, okay? ET, same thing. But the core genes, the one that both men and women dysregulate, those are the genes that cause the disease. So there's 102 genes in P-Vera, only 17 in ET. How can they be the same disease? The overlap is 1%. They can't. And then if you look something more telling, how long people live, and this is, don't take this as, oh, I only have so many years to live. That is bogus. This is all retrospective stuff going back many years. But ET has a different natural history than PV and different than PMF. Why is that important? Well, back when we got the JAK2 mutation, everything changed, and the World Health experts decided, you know what, PV... We can diagnose it now. We've got the JAK2 mutation. Bone marrow, well, it was already proven that that was bogus. The 
try and tell what disease anyone had because it's all the same mutations. So we're going to pick hemoglobin levels. They could have picked red cell count. They could have picked hematocrit. They're all do the same thing. And seven years later, guess what? Uh, we just revised everything. Do you think that made any difference? No. You look here, the conflation of ET, PV, and ET, and what you see is, if you can see, but I'll have to, I can't even see it, but it's there, um, is that PV, the highest hemoglobins are 22 and a half grams. Okay, I get that. But if you look over here in ET, guess what, folks? How can these people have ET when they have hemoglobins of 22.5 grams? How'd this get through the reviewers? How did it get through the writers? How did it get through the editors? And of course, PMF, same thing. And down here, oh look, CalR, guess what? You can get PV. So that's a problem. And then there's the latest bright, shiny toy, PreMF. Everyone's going to look for PreMF. So I said, oh, this is really interesting. Let's go look at the patients. And if you look at the patients, nobody with ET has a hemoglobin of 17.6 grams. And here in early PMF, clearly we violated the World Health Organization. Um, fake news, sorry. Okay, and really quickly, here's a what I call a myeloproliferative masquerade. Here's a patient coming out of the Midwest to see me. 1985 at a high platelet count, had splenomegaly, had myelofibrosis, and they couldn't decide what disease the patient had. Now, of course, according to the World Health Organization today, it has to be primary myelofibrosis. So in 1993, eight years later, she comes to see me. Now the white count's tripled, the platelet count is doubled. The hemoglobin hasn't changed, but the spleen in this small lady was down into the pelvic brim. So you can't have a big spleen and have a normal hemoglobin level any more than you can have a pregnancy and have a normal hemoglobin level. So we did, uh, uh, Dr. Silver has certainly pioneered at Cornell, uh, measured the absolute red cell mass in the total body and the plasma volume. It's very simple to do. And she had um, almost a liter and a half of excess red cells and almost uh, three extra units of plasma. So just tremendous expanded 6,000, six liters of blood in this small lady's body. So she has polycythemia vera, and the reason that's true is because normally, this is the hematocrit, these are the red cells, this is the plasma. If you have bad lungs, you increase your red cells. You don't increase your plasma because the body likes to keep the same blood volume because it's the same vessels. But if you have polycythemia vera, the body doesn't get the hypoxic signal, and it increases the red cells, increases the plasma, everything looks normal. Now, for some reason, the experts aren't interested in that. So I just have to throw that out because that's life in the NPN fast lane. Now, more to your interests are this, that um, normally when you get a mutation, you only get it in one allele of the two alleles, one on each chromosome. But sometimes you get it on both chromosomes. And this happens more often in polycythemia vera than other diseases. And so this is how you get disease. One cell gets transformed, it gets a JAK2 mutation, and then it may double itself and have two mutations, and now you can clonally dominate because this cell with the two mutations is more fit than the normal stem cell. And remember, you're making too many normal cells. They look normal, they generally behave normal. Sometimes I say platelets get sticky, but so now you have more of the tumor than you have of normal. And that's how diseases progress. This is a nice study done a number of years ago, Dr. Moliterno, and this just looks at time, time, and time in the three diseases, and the allele burden. How many cells have the mutation? Look at ET. <laughs> Virtually no homozygosity, okay, or no clonal dominance. And look, PV, you have either or, and PMF, it's mostly all clonal dominance. So I'm going to skip that out of time. Skip that, yeah. Um, so in polycythemia, we have two different diseases that we've shown. You have a benign disease that generally only need aspirin and not always aspirin, and phlebotomy. Well, then you have an aggressive disease. Now it's important to know who gets the aggressive disease. A large study from Italy 
11% of patients. And it's also important to know that even if you have an aggressive disease, you don't generally have, um, if you don't have anemia, what, what I'm trying to say here is that if you have myelofibrosis, you can make blood normally. It's a bad stem cell. Um, so that's the first point. Now, let's go past that and um, let me come to the end of the line here. I didn't get into uh, myelofibrosis for time, but in myelofibrosis, an entirely different disease, you have three different prognostic um, categories, or four. Um, low risk, uh, intermediate one, intermediate two, and high risk. And the difference there is they're all clonally dominant, is what other mutations patients have. So we often, in that disease, uh, ask patients to have what we can do, the new NGS uh, criteria. So let me stop there and just sort of summarize what I've been saying here. Um, uh, these are clonal disorders that share common mutations activating JAK2 directly or indirectly. They share common clinical features because of JAK2 activation, which is exaggerated by the development over time of homozygosity of the mutation, or less commonly homozygosity of MPL or CalR but they are all genetically different diseases. There are genetic predispositions, which I've shown you in mutations, or less commonly germline or familial predisposition. There's a specific type of uh, MPN uh, acquired. The type of MPN acquired is due to the host genetic variation. More than one driver mutation can be acquired in a patient, but only one's going to be dominant. So if you only do qualitative assays, you won't know what's going on, or your physician won't. So in PV, the clinical phenotype depends in part on the number of HSC, the stem cells with the driver mutation, and whether it's heterozygous or homozygous. Aging is one of the most significant factors in acquiring mutations, and specific mutations that will promote malignant transformation are the most common ones associated with the aging process. The acquisition of JAK2 is age independent but increases after age 60 because of age. MPNs evolve over time as the population expands. And morphology reflects this, but it can't be diagnostic because they all have the same mutations. PV is the most common mutation and the one with the most serious early complications. It should be the first diagnosis sought. A normal hematocrit hemoglobin level red cell count doesn't exclude PV if a myeloproliferative neoplasm is a diagnostic consideration because of plasma volume expansion. So the cells produced in the MPN are not abnormal. It's the involved stem cell. So chemotherapy is really an inappropriate type of therapy since it won't destroy the stem cell and has never been shown to be the first line of therapy for these disorders.